Welcome and thank you for joining us today for Taming the Beast, Extracting Value from Hadoop. Today's speakers are John Myers, Managing Director of, at EMA, and Ingo Mirzwa, Founder and CTO at RapidMiner. I'm Lindsay Wise, and I will be moderating this panel today. I have over 10 years' experience in software research, BI consulting, and strategy development. My focus at EMA is business intelligence for mid-market organizations, as well as data integration, data governance, cloud technologies, data visualization, analytics, and collaboration. Our speakers um, I'd really like to introduce. So in his role as managing director at, of business intelligence practice area, John delivers comprehensive coverage of the BI and data warehouse industry with a focus on database management, data integration, data visualization, and process management solutions. Ingo is an industry veteran data scientist and is also very passionate about the technological innovation enabled by the open source community and envisions a world where easy-to-use predictive analytics software empowers all business analysts and data scientists. He's also the author of many numerous award-winning publications related to predictive analytics and big data and has also spoken at countless industry events. So before we start, let's do, go through some of the logistics of today's event. At the conclusion, we will have a Q&A period. If you'd like to submit any of your questions, please log them through the course of the presentation using the Q&A functionality located in the right-hand corner of your screen. Today's event is also being recorded, so you will receive a link to the on-demand version. So be on the lookout for an email from EMA, Enterprise Management Associates, coming to your inbox tomorrow. If you'd like to contribute or have any comments during Twitter, please leave comments using the handle listed on this screen. So now what I'd like to do is start our panel discussion by turning it over to John and finding out what some of the issues organizations have are with data lakes. Well, thank you very much, Raleigh. It's great to be here on the panel with uh, yourself and with Ingo. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting for us to talk a little bit about, you know, where people are seeing their adventures, if you will, uh, with Hadoop and how they can get the most value out of that. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed in, uh, in our EMA research uh, over the last couple of years is that uh, the concept of the data lake is becoming a very important architectural choice for folks. But also there's an interesting kind of uh, dichotomy there for, for organizations that have had a taste uh, of Hadoop um, they seem very interested in trying to move down the path toward the data lake uh, implementation. And for those that haven't ex quite experienced uh, the, the fun or wh whatever we want to call it, the architectural challenges of Hadoop, they're still a little skeptical about the data lake architecture. Uh, you know, in our recent research on, in regards to big data and next generation uh, data platforms, we found that it was almost split about a third, a third, a third. You know, a third of our respondents uh, we're really excited about data lakes and the concept that it brought to, to their business. And a third of them were saying that it was, you know, at the very least a 2016, if not a later uh, initiative that they were going to look at. And when we broke that down by organizations that had Hadoop into their platform or into their environment, their ecosystem, we found that those numbers kind of got exacerbated. So if you had Hadoop, your, your, your likelihood of going down a, a data lake path increased. And if you didn't, it actually fell precipitously. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting concept and it provides us with some great opportunities. Ingo, from your experience, what have you seen uh, in terms of how people are using data lake architectures? Well, I think um, I've seen, hi, yes, first of all, uh, to, to um, all the participants, super happy to talk to you today. And, and of course, with you, John, we uh, know each other for quite some time now. So let's talk about data lakes. Um, my initial statement and comment on this, well, in my opinion, is really a mess. Um, that's, that's what they are. Um, you talked about architectures, and there are certain technology architectures. And from, for me, being a technologist, they are exciting. But the technology on, on its own isn't solve anything. So first of all, it's a mess because nobody understands what really is going in there, how to get the data out there. Um, they are schemaless, which is or typically they are. Most of, of installations are uh, as schemaless as they can be, which is great. So you throw in your data first without ne even need to think about um, how do you really set up the relationships between your data. This is something you can do at a later time. So I said it's a mess, and people are 
still a little bit unsure. They're investing sometimes even millions of dollars into, into setting actually up Hadoop clusters, NoSQL databases, or other technologies, and then they figure out, okay, what can we actually do with this only afterwards? Um, but this mess also is coming with a huge advantage, and that's something we see, especially in the last 12 months, more and more often. Um, the big advantage is flexibility. If you don't need to think about what you want to do with the data in advance while you're storing it, you can really focus on just storing basically everything. And then later during analysis time, you really start thinking about, well, what is actually the, the use case delivering the best outcome? And that is something which can, can play for your benefits. And, and I only see this turn of events only very recently that organizations actually embrace this fact that they, that they can um, really look for the best use case, delivering the best business outcome um, at a later stage. Another point I would like to make is the granularity of the data which is stored in data lakes in most Hadoop architectures in, in, in particular. The granularity is much higher, so it's much finer. So you really store events um, on an event base. You're not aggregating the data already up. You're not thinking about a data warehouse like structure. How you, can you best aggregate the data for your BI report or your, or your pie chart showing you later on what has happened in the past. You really stay on this very fine level. And this is playing very nicely with more advanced analytics techniques uh, like predictive analytics because typically you want to go down to this event level um, in order to make pr predictions for the, for the current situation, uh, figure out what is the most likely outcome for the current situation, and then be proactive about this. This is something where you need this fine granularity, and this is opened up um, for you with, with data lakes now, and you can address complete new use cases by that. No, I, and I agree with you, Ingo. I think that you know there, there's that promise of the data lake, and you know as the graphic we have on screen kind of shows, we we think of it as that pure blue waters and things of that nature. But the the downside is if you just throw stuff into your Hadoop architecture, um, and you don't you don't do some of the the if you will the data governance or data quality aspects with it to to keep it refreshed to keep understanding where it is you can get into what some people refer to as the data swamp issue and i think that's one of the fears as you pointed out that people have when they start down this path of the event level data as we move you know from you know, online and then mobile and social, and I think as we move even closer into the Internet of Things where we get that finer and finer grain of detail, it's possible that people, if they fire and forget into their data lake, there's that risk of it becoming the, the data swamp or things of that nature. And I think that's one of the keys that people need to, need to get to to say, hey, how do we get value out of uh, our data lake architecture. So, you know, I, I agree with you in that respect. It takes a little bit more care in feeding than just setting up the Hadoop architecture and, and as, as we like to talk about at EMA sometimes, simply dumping information into that architecture <laughs> and then having it go down that path. But it's, it's, it's a valuable first step for organizations that I think is key because if they're not used to that level of granularity, if they're not used to these new data sources that they either before didn't have access to or, um, you know, sent to tape or um, sometimes often just, you know, deleted slash sent to dev null, you've got a situation where it's like, hey, how do we get used to these things? How do we put our, our fingers into the data and how do we get used to what we want to do? Uh, and I think that uh, it's a great it's a great opportunity and it's also a great, um, if you will, um, cost that comes with that because you, you need to put your mind to what you're trying to do with that. So, um, And I think that's a really good point in terms of, you know, how organizations might be struggling with actually having, you know, this data lake environment, but then from there, where do they go? What have you seen within EMA research or just in the market, John, in relation to how organizations get over their obstacles or what type of obstacles exist in relation to implementing analytics specifically with Hadoop once they have all of this information and have gathered it and have the right granularity? What, what happens from there? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting. As people start moving towards implementing analytics in their big data environments, uh, one of the, the, the big issues is they find there's a, a prohibitive total cost of ownership issue. And it's not necessarily licensing, because you know, I'm sure there's some people who are joining us 
uh, for this discussion to talk about Hadoop, and they go, well, Hadoop is, is free. Um, well, Apache Hadoop is free to download, but if you want to go through that hand-rolling, uh, you know, command line interface aspect of it, it oftentimes can take longer for, for a non-initiated data scientist uh, to get up to speed to do that. And then it can also, as you move down and you start to operationalize it, it can take a longer process uh, to get those up and running. And another thing is, is when you start talking about analytics, uh, you're talking about the, the merging of structured and multi-structured data together. And we found that almost 13% uh, of our respondents are telling us that a shortage of data connections, you know, getting, you know, breaking down the silos between our structured and our multi-structured environments are some of the, the, the big obstacles uh, that go on to that. Uh, Ingo, in your experience in doing analytics on big data in Hadoop, what are, what are some of the things that you and your team are seeing as, as being key or, you know, some of those blocks that uh, keep people from making the best? Yep. Um, no, I'm fully with you. And, and the, the good old data silo, it, it, it was a problem already with the uh, with, with data, more traditional data warehouses. It stays a problem um, even today. I would even say the problem is a little bit higher than, than it used to be, and the reason is simply because only few people right now can actually access Hadoop clusters. The level of tech, technology skills which is necessary to work efficiently with the Hadoop cluster is, is very high. And in fact, I would, I would even go that far if, if you're not like an a command line and, and programming hero, you, you probably are more likely to fail as of today. And the reason is simply because if you're missing like, an, like a visual layer on top of this or, or a, a better administration uh, frameworks, then most users who, who might have access to other data sources will never be able to connect them actually to your Hadoop cluster. So it's really, this is, this is a problem which might be even, even harder. Think also about um, elements like security. Um, Hadoop is still a very, well, it's a fastly, quickly evolving technology. Um, security aspects haven't been very important in, in the first years of existence of Hadoop. Now it's becoming more and more important. There are changes almost every single week. Um, Hadoop vendors are, are publishing new updates on especially aspects like security and data governance. So this is a, is a huge level of or fees of investment which is happening right now. But combine this now, which is making all, everything even more abstract, even more technical, combine this now with all those technical difficulties you have with Hadoop already, and then you're, you're actually cutting out uh, most of your people, most of your analysts within your organization from, from accessing and working efficiently with Hadoop. So I do believe you need sort of having an additional layer um, on top of your Hadoop cluster, because otherwise you're spending 90% and more of your time in the command line to administer a cluster and, and, and actually making changes, and that's, that's not acceptable any longer. Think about self-service BI tools uh, or, or data discovery tools like, like a Tableau or Click. You, you can't really imagine those people now going back to the command line and figuring out how to, to get to the best setting. So this is really sort of a conflict I see here and also between people and um, and, and, well, the technology itself, and that's always a bad sign if that happens. So I think this is one of the biggest obstacles. Another one is about the understanding of, of Hadoop, um, that it actually consists of multiple layers. But I think we will we'll probably talk about this in the next section about, well, how to really process the data in, in, uh, in Hadoop anyway. Yeah, no, and, and I... Yeah, and that's... I, pardon me, Lindsay. I think, Ingo, you, you raise a great point. A lot of those folks that use that type of graphical interface from a click or a tableau, they've never been command line folks. And uh, to, to suddenly present them with a more command line interface is, is also a big obstacle that we see uh, in, in our research to people using that type of, uh, of, of environment. And, and Lindsay, I apologize. Back to you. No problem. I was going to say that both of you, especially Ingo, your your comments lead really amazingly into the segue of, you know, there are all these challenges, and so what are the processing requirements for predictive analytics, and how do organizations get there? So I'll start with you, John, and then move yep. on to Ingo. Yeah, no, in, in our research we found that, um, you know, we, we've looked at oh, well over uh, 1,000 projects in our, in our most recent um, big data uh, research, and we found that almost 65% of those projects have a very um, 
high standard for speed of response or a very low latency uh, processing requirement. So, you know, almost a, a complete third were thinking about doing their projects in real time or near real time, and another 25% or nearly 25% of those respondents were saying that intra-hour processing of their information was going to be important to what they were trying to accomplish. This, and when you mix these concepts with some of the, the processing requirements of, of, of Hadoop or capabilities of Hadoop, you start to see a little bit of a disconnect where you start to see we've got these requirements for a much faster uh, speed of response, yet we still have, uh, we still have a lot of these folks who are trying to use Hadoop to meet these requirements. So Lindsay, uh, would you like to? Uh, yeah, so I'm 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 happy actually to, um, uh, to to pick up what I what I mentioned before already on the um, on the big obstacles. I think, and sometimes it drives me nuts actually. <laughs> I I think the one of the biggest problems and obstacles and challenges really around around Hadoop is a, a very frequent lack of understanding that Hadoop actually consists of two different elements. Um, Hadoop is both a distributed data storage and a distributed compute framework. In fact, if you look into the original ideas behind Hadoop going back into the years 2005 and following, you will find that actually everything was about processing and distributed processing, not so much about the storage. This was just like a requirement to make the processing possible at all. So this is really what Hadoop is about. It consists of those two layers. So you can see if for a Hadoop cluster like on the slide here, um, you often have like one orchestration node or whatever it's called, um, which is taking the jobs which need to be done, and those jobs are then distributed across all those different worker nodes, which took, and each node consists of those two layers. The HDFS layer, which is the distributed file storage, or in general, data storage, and the MapReduce layer, which really is about um, the distributed computation. And of course, there are new technologies like Spark, et cetera, but that, that's not the point. If it's now MapReduce or something else, that doesn't matter. This, and, and for this discussion here, the whole point really I want to make is it's both. It's not just a very efficient and cheap way to store data. It's also a very efficient and, yes, also relatively cheap way to make very complex computations. And this is interesting because most users we are seeing in the market right now actually only make use of the distributed storage, not so much um, of the distributed compute framework. And part of the reason is um, the platforms and analytical tools they are using on top of, of Hadoop, they are not really very good in supporting this. We talked about a couple of BI and data discovery tools before. Um, the same is true for predictive analytics. Most analytical, um, uh, especially the workflow-based um, products, they actually take the data out of Hadoop and make the computation of very complex models in memory. But wait a second, isn't that actually ridiculous? You just invested some millions into your Hadoop cluster and setting everything up, or you invested a lot of time setting up your Hadoop cluster and, 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 and um, on, on commodity hardware at least, and then you take the data out of there for, for doing the computation on one single node on, on your desktop? That, that sounds ridiculous. And although this might not be a big problem if all you're doing is basically doing some counts, and this might be even well supported by some Hadoop technologies like Hive and Parler, et cetera, it becomes more and more important to do the computation inside of Hadoop when you're doing more advanced models. So think, since I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with all the different machine learning methods, but think of, a, let's say, a neural network which somewhat mimics the function of uh, the human brain, and I'm sure we can all agree that this is probably something which is quite complex. If you think about all the computations involved in, in that, you really should make use of this distributed horsepower you have available and not just take the data out and compute somewhere else. So in, in the rapid minor case, by the way, this is uh, what this slide here is showing. Um, we try to really combine the best of both worlds. I said before that we, that, we, that we do see an obstacle if it's becoming too technical, too command line oriented. So we want to take this graphical user interface of rapid minor for building predictive analytics processes and th those processes can be built by basically anyone, but then we transform those processes into Hadoop instructions uh, or Hadoop code, native code, which is then pushed down into the cluster. And this is really what I think is important to do and also sort of a best practice here, because for this, the data remains in Hadoop, but the results, the computation is also happening in Hadoop, and only the results are delivered back to the business. 
if you don't do this and just take a sample out there and do the computation in memory, you only use small data samples. You might not find all the patterns. If you miss the patterns in your data, you typically miss business opportunities, which is not a good idea. So if you already invest into the Hadoop cluster, just for the interest of getting to the best models and the best business outcome, you should really push down the computation there as well. And there is some lack of understanding preventing many people from doing so or even looking for solutions supporting this. And so that brings up a really good point of, you know, you have the basics, but what are some of the success in terms of actually realizing this and creating successful big data analytics projects? So first I'd like to start with John and some of what you've seen within research in the market, and then, you know, Ingo, you'll be able to provide some of those real-world examples and, and what you've been seeing as well. Well, Lindsay, in terms of project successes, uh, in part, part of the EMA research we've seen is that a lot of times the analytical projects that are performed in these types of environments, um, when they're linked to either top-line revenue, uh, whether that be some type of cross-sell, upsell, uh, direct to customers, or in some form or fashion, market basket analysis to help organizations understand how to better treat uh, customers. Uh, that's a key component of it. Another one is in terms of lowering costs. Um, um, and uh, at that point, you know, looking at things like fraud analysis, uh, liquidity risk, things that are going to lower their exposure uh, to additional costs in the organization. So in terms of EMA research showing what types of analytical projects are going to be doing the best. We found that organizations that are linking those projects, like I said, directly to top line revenue or helping to increase margins and lower costs in the organization, those are the ones that are going to be the most uh, successful in, the, in those regards. So, um, you know, I think those are the keys. I, I think, you know, sometimes it's kind of self evident, but if if we can take those analytical um, components and focus them in on, you know, those top and bottom line numbers, that gets the interest not only of the CIO, but it gets the attention of the CFO who starts to bankroll these projects. As, as Ingo pointed out, you spend all this money on a, on a Hadoop environment and you're really struggling to find those return on investment types of numbers, focusing projects in those particular areas are, are keys to having success. Uh, Ingo, what have you seen uh, in terms of Rapid Miner putting together uh, projects that make their making their organizations work? Yeah, so we've been working in the past with really all kinds of different um, uh, teams uh, and of all kinds of different sizes. And one thing I found interesting that when it comes to Hadoop, um, at the latest, typically when, when advanced politics are already in the play, in the mix before, it's no longer something where, where you only have like a lone wolf doing something. If you want to be really successful, you better start off with a team that is collaborating very strongly with, with, with each other. Um, and those teams really need to cover so many different aspects. Um, and we often require those aspects from a data scientist or, already, which I find quite both because a single person typically can't cover them all. Those are aspects like business understanding, um, data understanding, how to work with the data. Of course, in the best case, everybody has a PhD in statistics, of course, um, all at the same time. And that's just not realistic. So let's, let's face it, if you have really, a, if you have business stakeholders in the team, if you have people who know how to work with the data, how to break down the silos as we discussed before, if you have people who bring some analytics understanding to the, to the mix, and of course all kinds of different soft skills um, like augmenting this um, when it comes to, um, to understanding the business problem but also to communicate the results back into the line of business. So this is one thing. But the other um, key point is actually connected to the ROI calculation you just pointed out, John. I find it interesting that in many cases, most of them don't even calculate a proper ROI. And the reason is that they are <laughs> that they're looking for the wrong answers. And um, i give you an example. If you think Hadoop and, for example, predictive analytics is going to help you making this once in a year big strategic decision right, then, yeah, there might be some value to this, but first of all, it's going to be difficult to calculate. The second thing is, I don't even believe it's the highest value which can be achieved. So if this is your approach, throwing the data, well, we can answer every single question, and, and, and um, especially those very important ones, 
you're probably not getting the point. I think the really the, the largest value is connected to operationalizing those predictive models. And instead of making one large big decision once in a year, you actually better do millions of more like micro predictions every single day. And what's the difference here? Because in this case, you know for every single situation, for all of those million cases per day, what is the outcome if I'm right or if I'm wrong? Typical examples like fraud detection are very good. So you can make the calculation, well, if I miss this fraud case, what's going to happen then? If I annoy a customer, what's going to happen then? Other good examples are churn prediction, for example. If I lose this customer, what does it mean for my business? If I make, let's say, an offer, an incentive, a discount, well, I might sacrifice something now and I can calculate this, but I'm also getting something back. Direct marketing, etc. All the cases where predictive analytics has been successful in the past have been, had some connection to operationalizing the model. So that means taking the predictive model, creating millions of small predictions, and embed the into your business processes. In the best case, automatically trigger those actions because no human being can act a million of times per day. And those are the cases where you not only get the biggest value, even better, you can also calculate what the value actually is and get this RI calculation. And whenever you do this, you will see it was actually worth doing this investment. But in other cases, you might get frustrated because you made all those investments and you don't even know what the outcome is. And, well, at least that would frustrate me and I'm sure even more the CFO. So that's really um, a great point of giving all of these questions and then looking at operationalizing predictive decisions and some of the issues that arise. What types of best practices do you have and advice that you can give to organizations struggling with these issues in relation to implementing advanced and modern analytics? So the best and uh, uh, most important hint I can give to everybody is please don't update your Hadoop cluster every week. Please don't do it. Um, it will break compatibility more often than not. And I know it's exciting. It's a very, as I said before, quickly evolving technology, and it's so intriguing to get access to the latest feature. But everybody should understand that all the analytical platforms, no matter if it's BI or advanced analytics, they are all running on top of this, and a change might quickly break compatibility. And, and then you're in trouble. So you're not doing this with your database um, just every week. So don't do this with your data lake. Um, so this is, it sounds ridiculous, but please, um, let's face it, um, let's hold back a little bit, let's figure out what is stable, let's give applications the time to, to catch up with this, with this high degree of innovation, um, because otherwise you're really going to be in trouble. So if there's no, nothing else, I would do at least this, because it's going to save you a lot of headaches. Um, I also think it's important to find a common platform to work on, so you can actually support this collaboration. And I don't believe that the command line is this com common platform, period. So I think it, it can augment this, and it always will, because there are some tasks where we need to go down to this technical level, but not going to support the communication between all the different stakeholders within your organization. So I think that's the second thing. And then the last thing, and maybe the most important thing, I think the time is over for those large multi-month projects, or maybe even multi-year projects. Um, today, you really want to... to establish more an agile approach to analytics on Hadoop. What do I mean by this? So typically, especially if you're going more down this path of advanced models, you can't really expect anybody to define the requirements for your predictive analytics model. Um, well, what should this requirement be? But something basically everybody can do is looking at results and deciding if this is a good result or not. So if that's the way to go, instead of defining the requirements, sitting in the basement for six months and creating a solution, then you should get to the first result as quickly as possible. So create the first results within an hour or a day and not within six months. Present the result, make sure this is leading somewhere because sometimes there is nothing in the data. It, it happens. So you should know this as fast as possible. You should know that this is leading to a solution which actually will be deployed later, will be operationalized later. And if that's the case, then quickly iterate from there. Have a new result day ready every single day. It might sound strange, but, but actually that's what modern software development is doing anyway. And I wouldn't say that software developing a piece of software is more complex than doing analytics on Hadoop. So I think there is 
the potential to, to follow a more agile approach. If you use the common platform, if you support the collaboration and communication, you can then circle back every single evening basically and say like, look, that's what we achieved today. Is this going to the right direction? Is it solving our problem? How can we make it better? And then you take it from there, iterate and improve over time. And this is, this is an approach which I found works much, much, much better than a little bit more old school project-based approaches which take a lot of time and then again might lead to frustration if the, um, if, if, if the desired result is not achieved. Right. So that's some really good points. Let's move on now that we have some best practices and look at the use of mixed environments for implement, implementing you know, big data analytics and just how that's affecting organizations and their leveraging of big data. John, do you have different thoughts on that? Well, it's, it's interesting. You know, a lot of times when we think about uh, a big data environment, we oftentimes think of a, a data center approach racks and racks of Hadoop and things of that nature. But on, a, on an ongoing basis, we're starting to see more organizations uh, utilizing a, a cloud-based architecture. So not just on-prem, but uh, you know, either pulling data from external sources or utilizing um, uh, resources outside of the data center to power the processing. Uh, the presentation and the storage uh, of their big data requirements. Uh, in EMA research, we're finding that of those 1,000 projects, nearly 35% of them are utilizing some form or fashion of cloud-based architecture that's outside uh, of the data center. So whether that be a hybrid approach using public cloud or using some form of, of externally managed uh, hosting or cloud service uh, where the organization is saying, you know, we're, we're try again, we're trying to focus on lowering some of our costs but maintaining that flexibility and elasticity that allows us to use those cloud resources. And Ingo, did you have anything to add based on John's insights? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I think it's John spot on. And and, and in today's uh, IT world, you, it, it, this is a trend which which you can no longer stop. It starts with mobility, which was fueling the cloud trend. And if every consumer is used to have the flexibility in both computational power, storage, uh, mobility, the cloud brings, of course, you're expecting something like this also from your from your business applications. And as a consequence, also from the analytics world. So I think it's a very natural, very logical trend. Um, but this is really about the, this is the question about where are things happening? Where is something stored? Where is it com computed? That is one element. But when it comes to Hadoop, I think there's a second element um, talking about the different um, well environments for implementing big data analytics. And that's really the question: Is Hadoop always the right environment to do the computation? Maybe there are some elements where you are better off with an in-memory approach. Sometimes it's best to push the computation to the traditional database because that's where the data lives. It might not be very large, and instead of moving this from your database into the Hadoop cluster, just to do some parallel processing might not be worth the overhead. So I, I've seen um, that in the best project, actually, you, you really mix the different environments. So that's not about the data silos, which is one aspect of this, but this is really about mixing the different compute environments. So first of all, is Hadoop always the right place? Well. Certainly not for small data, let's face it. If you're analyzing with a not very complex machine learning model um, and a data set of only a couple of thousands of data points, the overhead which is coming with Hadoop is so large that it's typically not worth the effort. Um, you're, you're so much better off um, just doing the computation in, in memory in, in a case like that. In, in fact, we did a little bit of tests in, in the past, um, seeing a couple of breakpoints. So, um, if you, for example, go up to, depending on the, on the specifics of the data set, about 100 million data points, often in a database approach, or if you invest it into larger um, memory infrastructure, still an in-memory approach is much better. Beyond this point, very often Hadoop clusters pay off big time. And this might be on transaction data for very large organizations, even on customer data. Um, but don't take it for granted that this is always the best case. So if that is true, if sometimes doing in-Hadoop processing is the best case and sometimes in-memory processing is the best um, solution you can do, then you really need to have an environment where you can design analytical workflows once, but then you can actually deploy them in different environments and push them down wherever the computation needs to happen. 
And I would even go even that far and say like, well, since in most cases this might even change while you're in one single analytical workflow, you should even have the capability of mixing and matching the different environments into the same process. Starting, for example, um, in the Hadoop cluster, doing the data pre-processing there, um, finally aggregating the data then, it's small enough, take it into memory, calculate the model there, push the model into the database, do the scoring there on your traditional customer data and your data warehouse. Just an example, but you can build an overall workflow doing this. This is a concept we call federated analytics, and I believe the best product out there should support it. Um, <coughs> cuff. Um, no need to mention that, of course, this is an approach Rapid Miner is pretty strong in. Um, and the reason is just because we know from our practical experience this is what you need to do. You need to mix and match those environments to get to the best outcomes. Just Hadoop is not going to be the answer for all your analytical problems. And so looking at some of the problems that people face, let's look at actually the evolving role of the data consumer and what's happening within organizations in relation to actually having companies take advantage of um, big data and Hadoop, predictive analytics, et cetera. John, what have you been seeing in the market? Well, oftentimes when we think about analytical users, we, we either think about uh, uh, the, the guy with the propeller on his head in the, in the ivory tower doing analytical stuff, or maybe we think about the pointy-haired boss from, from Dilbert, you know, uh, in his TPS reports. And to a certain extent, these are kind of our old school uh, thoughts about where we're going because what we're really seeing now in, in the future is a more technically savvy business analyst, uh, an individual who is capable of looking at multiple components associated with what they're trying to do. They're not afraid of the technological aspects of where, you know of, a, of an analytical model. They may not be ready to jump all the way down to the command line, but they're saying, hey, give me the tools that I need so that I can start to look at, you know, is it, um, you know, is it some type of, as Ingo pointed out, a neural net type of uh, analytical processing model? Is it a, a regression model that I'm looking at? What, you know, they'll be able to understand some of the components that they have because they're very familiar with the data, whether they've gotten it as a, an export from, from some other platform, whether it's in Hadoop, whether it's in a structured platform, whether it's in some of the new event-based uh, information such as JSON. Um, but these business stakeholders who have a, a strong technical background are people who are not afraid of it, and but they're also looking for a certain amount of analytical, um, sometimes I call it inertia, sometimes uh, refer to it as that iterative nature of it where, you know, the person wants to sit there and be able to say, okay, let me test the model, see if it's giving me the results I'm looking for, maybe not, let's adjust a couple of pieces. In an older environment, we may have said, okay, I didn't get the results I wanted, let me rewrite the requirements, send it over to IT and get the information back. But what they're really looking for now is to be able to sit and iteratively and interactively use those models until they kind of fine tune them to the point that they're looking for. Um, but that's what we're seeing in our, in our EMA research is that these data consumers are changing from simply an IT based or simply a business based and we're starting to see a much stronger mix between those two components. I, yes, and that's exactly what I meant before, John, when I, when I talked also about the agility, because if this role is evolving and the analytics consumers can also become the analytics producers, you can actually be more agile. This whole circle <laughs> you just described, like between requirements, implementation, etc., you shorten it down because it's really becoming the same person or team of people collaborating there. Um, and this accelerates this whole time to model and, and then, of course, time to value as, as a consequence as well. So I think this is really exactly the key point. There's some evolution of the people. There's evolution of the technology supporting people to become the producers themselves. And that is, um, that is really what, what excites me because, well, finally, it gets out of the hands of very few experts into the into the hands of more people. It's, it's almost democratized. I wouldn't go that far, but um, yet at least. But uh, that's 
certainly a trend we, we, we want to support and, and actually will enjoy. I think there's a second element to this also. If, if for example, a business analyst or a little bit more advanced Excel power user, if they are the power to work with technologies like, like Hadoop or uh, predictive analytics themselves, that also frees up those very, very um, scare resources, scarce resources, not scarce, I think, um, there's rare resources at least, uh, the, of, of the data scientists. So it's difficult to find them. Um, it's difficult to hire them. So if you found one, two, three, ten, whatever it is your organization have in place, you don't want them to, to do the day-to-day -day predictive modeling. You want them to actually focus on those very innovative, very new cases which require data science. So that means already something which never has been done before. You want to push the edge here, so or push the envelope. So it's really... Uh, also about freeing those people up. Let everybody focus on what they are best on. A data scientist should focus on a problem which never has been solved before. A, a, an analyst who can be both producer and consumer of the analytics, they should actually do um, all those little bit more standard analysis, which are still not standard as of today for most organizations, but they could be because they no longer require um, the, 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 hack, the hacking skills and writing 100,000 lines of code. Um, they, they can really do this in a much more agile way themselves in, in many cases. And this is really a, a separation of work um, which is supporting most organizations much better than, than how it's happening today where data scientists sitting there doing very basic data transformations or, or well, pivoting some data or, or doing an aggregation, all things I think data scientists shouldn't be doing, to be, to be honest. Right. So in terms of kind of expanding that of the types of users, what are different use cases that you've seen in relation to how organizations are really monetizing their data and providing the insights that they need to their businesses based on multi-structured data sets? Well, um, I, I, I would like to give you, um, I think, two examples here. So the first one, um, uh, it's, it's together with the BBC. There there's was a project uh, Rapid Miner did in the past. So the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, I think, so everybody probably knows them. Um, and then there's Zatsu. Uh, Zatsu is an Internet TV provider originally from Switzerland, but I think they also start providing their services now um, in the United States as well. So we did a project with uh, those two television corporations to better understand what are actually the viewing habits of, of um, well, TV viewers um, and do sort of a churn analysis there as well um, in the sense of, well, if somebody is watching, let's say, BBC Channel 1, and you realize that this person is not very interested in, in, interested in the current video stream, then you might make a recommendation, let's say, on the BBC app well, you're currently watching BBC One, but we highly recommend you to the program on BBC Two because you are very, going to be very interested in this uh, animal documentary we are showing there right now. Just as an example. So this is sort of a recommendation engine, a churn prevention engine based on video streams. So not just in the case of BBC, it's like maybe they have like eight channels or something, I don't know. Um, in case of that two, they have 250 different channels they are supporting from all over Europe. So if you have 250 different video streams, you're constantly analyzing them. At the same time, you have 10 million viewers watching those streams, giving recommendations. It can't become more difficult than that. So really, you have only very few seconds' time to realize, oh, my God, this person is probably switching the channel very soon. We don't want them to do something else or go into the wrong channel. Let's make them a recommendation to continue viewing here. And this was a kind of modeling we did um, together with BBC and that too, processing all those different viewers, processing all the different um, video streams in real time to make the program recommendations um, and, and as a first step. Later on, I can only assume that there are certainly plans for also um, personalizing advertisements. So based on your viewing behavior, based on maybe your behavior, what kind of ads you have been interested in the past, you can also deliver, especially in the case of an IPCV, provider like that too can also provide, um, provide personalized advertisement for every single viewer at the same time. So this was one, um, one very interesting project I found um, where, where, well, big data analytics played an important role. Um, another example um, would be with a company uh, from the UK. The company name is Growth Intelligence. This is a B2B company actually offering their clients 
insights into potential sales leads and giving them a prediction score, what are the sales leads which are most likely to convert. So that means, well, if you're now um, offering a service to your clients, instead of just like doing like a random phishing here and just offering your service to everybody, um, they are supporting you in picking those prospects um, which are most likely to be interested into your, into your offer or in your offer. So the challenge here is actually that there are so many different data sources. Um, so if you really want to like, would like to see everything which is said about basically every single company in the UK, just as an example, you need to monitor all the different corporate performance data. You need to monitor social media streams um, to see what people are saying about those, about those organizations. Um, the news, of course, so it's really structured data or unstructured data, and it's a constant stream of, of sources. In fact, they call it subject matter experts here because most of this is really coming from social media and news, um, but a lot of this is also coming from financial uh, data services. They analyzed 4.5 million different data sources on basically all those organizations every single day. Um, structured and unstructured information, unstructured information, combine everything, mesh up all the different information they have, apply the predictive models for the different clients um, growth intelligence now has, um, to, to predict out of information what are the most likely um, prospects to, to convert. So and this, is, this is another interesting case. This wouldn't have been possible like, I don't know, five years ago. Um, or you could do this, but there's much less sources, more gut feeling based, uh, manual reading involved. So just think about how technology has, has actually opened up this, this potential to really, um, well, mesh up the different data sources and, and create the predictive models in, in real time. So that's a really great point. John, did you have anything to add in relation to different use cases and kind of where organizations go based on all of, all of the different um, aspects that you've discussed today? Well, you know, I, I think that what we need to really focus on is that you know, what, things that Ingo and I have uh, that we've talked about throughout the course of the day are, you know, data lakes are an emerging data management architecture, um, and that they are going to provide a lot of value uh, in the future. But w there are issues in making sure that those components really become part of what you're looking for. We've talked about data governance. We've talked about being able to understand the data. It's not just a place where you dump information and it will magically sprout. There's no magic bean here. There's a lot of hard work that goes into that. Um, and then, you know, following some of our best practices, or what sometimes I like to call them best patterns. Uh, Ingo made a great comment earlier today, treat your Hadoop environment like it's a production environment. Um, you know, instead of messing around with it, you know, constantly tweaking, um, you know, there are some components of a production environment that need to go through some of those stages, and some of those are data governance, data quality. But the reason I call it a pattern instead of a best practice is that we don't want to bring the exact steps that we use in our in our structured environments to our Hadoop environment. They're they're different. Um, structured versus multi-structured, the type of data we're looking at, um, things of that nature. So we still need to bring those goals of making sure we've got good quality data. But you know, I don't think that we need to go down to the every field has to be perfect layer, particularly if we're pulling out information from uh, log files or things of that nature. We don't need to do some of those steps. We may need to do some spot checking, et cetera. But I think that data lineage is going to be important in some of those things. But I think that if we realize that data lakes are going to be important, we make sure that, we, that they don't turn into data swamps and that we follow some of our existing uh, best practices or best patterns. Those will be the things that really make um, big data analytics move on from where we are today. Great. Um, thanks, John. I think both you and Ingo not only gave some great insights, but also some great examples about, you know, different research and trends within the organizations where, you know, how organizations are really applying this. So now we're in the Q&A portion of the event. I'd just like to remind you all that you can log your questions using the Q&A functionality located in the right-hand corner of your screen, and we've been receiving a lot of great questions already. Alternatively, you can also ask questions or leave comments using the Twitter handles on this screen. So now let me move into some of the questions that have been asked. And I'm going to start with a general question, which is more a high level related to what exactly 
Hadoop is, and there's actually a question in relation to this in terms of is Hadoop a cloud-based data analysis tool or otherwise, and then how does Hadoop compare to R, which serves the same for data scientists? So um, either one of you can address this just in terms of, I guess, providing an overview of what Hadoop is in relation to, you know, how it compares to R and what type of data analysis tool it is or isn't. Well, I think probably I'm I'm um, I'm, I'm best uh, for for answering those questions. So um, Hadoop, first of all, is independent of uh, of the cloud, or uh, you can run Hadoop clusters in the cloud or not. So in a nutshell, a Hadoop cluster is a, is a set of computers. Typically, it's computers that could be virtual nodes, but that doesn't matter. Just think, let's say you say you set up hundred computers, and every computer can store part of the data and can take over part of the computation you want to do on this data. So by that, you're distributing this, uh, this computation. And you're doing this with a couple of paradigms, like for example, MapReduce, which has been invented like oh, 10 years ago by companies like Google, and in order to, well, mm, transform very complex computations uh, into this parallel, parallel processing framework. So first of all, Hadoop is nothing else than, than having those, those this, 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 this paradigm, this framework for distributed computation and data storage across multiple computers. Um, so that's, that's the basic idea. If this cluster of computers is now running on premises or in the cloud, it doesn't actually really matter. Both can happen, but, but that's really what it is. How does it relate to R? Well, R is a programming language for statistical functions mainly, and they cover some machine learning, um, of, of course, as well. Um, and you can program, since it's a programming language, also all kinds of data preprocessing there. It's, of course, a solution for people who can code. Everybody else can't really use it. You can. There are some new, newer technologies that they like Spark R, which will leave better mode, I think, in September, most likely, if I remember correctly. Um, you can take R scripts and, and try to distribute them among Hadoop clusters as well for distributed computation. Reality is, as of today, not very many functions will be supported for doing that. And that's a very natural thing. If you think about certain algorithms which just can't be distributed, well, if you do this in R or in Rapid Minor or whenever, it's not going to be distributed, period. So, but yes, R is a programming language um, for doing advanced analytics, for doing statistical analysis, statistical tests, and some technologies exist today to perform R scripts on, on Hadoop. In case of Rapid Minor, let's just allow me to add this because I think we got another question. This question was, um, well, somebody liked Rapid Minor a lot, and, and I'm happy about this, of course. And, um, but it, this person, I don't know who that was, doesn't really matter, I'm so sorry, I think it might have been Adam, Adam but, but I'm not sure. Um, is Rapid might have taken advantage of a distributed processing like we just discussed for, discussed for R and Hadoop because this would allow Rapid might to scale up to much larger data sets. And yes, the answer clearly is yes. We acquired a company last year called Radoop. Radoop is short for Rapid Miner on Hadoop. Um, and you can use the same graphical user interface you're used to in Rapid Miner. And Rapid Miner then pushes down the computation into the Hadoop cluster. So that's exactly the whole point about Rapid Miner and Hadoop. You, it feels like you're doing the analysis in memory, but in fact, the computation is happening in the Hadoop cluster. So with Rapid Miner, we really try to bring together all the different worlds. You can push down um, Rapid Miner processes into the cluster. You can even integrate R scripts into the Rapid Miner process, and we will support also pushing down those R scripts into the Hadoop cluster as soon as, for example, technologies like Spark R are leaving better mode um, in next month as well. Great. Um, so let's go on to our next question. How do you perform analytics on data which is totally unstructured and especially data generated from e-commerce sites? John, did you want to tackle that yeah. one? No, and, and it, it, I think that uh, when we talk about um, the unstructured data that resides in a Hadoop cluster or some of the other NoSQL platforms, we are in fact talking about data that does have a structure to it because I think the only truly unstructured data is uh, randomly assigned ones and zeros. Um, but what we have is multi-structured data, which means that we need to start uh, either accepting it in the format that it exists in, 
or uh, kind of pulling out the elements that we would like to do. So we can do analytics on multi-structured data. We have to do some transformation that's, that's associated with that uh, to feed it into some of the models. Um, but when we think about unstructured, I, I like to talk about multi-structured uh, because it just it gives you a better sense of how that goes. Um, Ingo, I'm sure that you can give some great examples of how you would take a multi-structured data set and transform it to make it go directly into a model. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so think about the growth intelligence use case we just discussed. Um, some of this data is, is coming from financial data providers. They typically are relatively structured, uh, which is good. Uh, but some other data, let's say the information you're posting on social media, um, this is typically just text. And one very, well, simple way um, uh, how to transform unstructured data like text into a structured format is um, make, taking advantage of the fact that in most languages, the order of words actually don't really matter um, to, to bring across the message. Uh, sometimes I'm doing this, and I'm sorry for this because English is not my native language, but still you can understand me, I, I hope at least. So I'm mixing words, I'm, I'm, I'm not using exactly the right grammar, but it doesn't matter. And why can you understand me? Because the words are still there. You can take a look at the words, you can count the words, how often did I use a certain term or word, like I'm doing it right now, and you can tell, well, right now he's using word at least five times within the last 60 seconds, so this might be about talking about text or docu documents. So you can extract, for example, topics or sentiment by just doing the count of words, normalize those counts in a very smart way with technologies like TF-IDF, and then using statistical models like, for example, support vector machines um, on those um, now structured formats to, for example, extract the topic, to cluster the data um, or the text documents, or to, um, uh, well, attach a sentiment prediction to this text document. So it's really about just transforming the data from unstructured into more structured format, and from there you can just go and continue with meshing up the data and using more, well, traditional um, uh, statistical models on top of that. Great. And I think we have time for one more question, so I'll ask one that is more general and straight to the point. Um, what are the components of a data lake? Ingo, would you like to start? What are the components oh, of a data right. lake? Well, I, yeah, I think I guess the, the, different aspects that you need. Uh, the first thing that Sorry. you're going to need is uh, you're going to need yourself a, a Hadoop cluster, um, and what you're going to need as part of that is, you know, a lot of organizations are finding that they like to segregate different areas of their data lake to, to say if we're going to do this type of processing in this area, things of that nature. So at that point, you know, you're starting to talk about simply about the storage aspects of it. I believe that the, the next key step that differentiates between a data swamp and a data lake um, is that those processing engines that allow you to get the value from your Hadoop uh, environment. One example would be a rapid monitor to do analytical types of, of processes. Um, others would be where you do be able to do some of the transformations that will get data moved from its, you know, raw or, um, you know, native state into a, a, a format that's more accessible either for analytics, whether it's uh, for um, operational uses, things of that nature. But, you know, the key is to have the storage layer with Hadoop and HDFS, and then to have the various processing engines that make the most out of that. But, um, Ingo, I think you probably would know more about how how the processing engines that um, RapidMiner uses on top of the data lake. And well, I, yeah, I but, but, that um, I actually need to interject here because we are at the top of the hour. So, right. um, unfortunately, we have to wrap up, even though um, – the you know participants can find more information on Rapid Miner and connect with you later. And for all of the questions that we haven't got to yet, we'll be sending them on so that they can be answered and so you will receive your replies. I'd like to thank you all for listening in today as well as thank John and Ingo for their amazing insights. Well thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.